Hi friends, in this video we're going to do a poetry analysis of one of the most iconic songs of the 20th century, Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan, and we'll see that there are two possible common misinterpretations. One is easy that most people fall into that's actually incorrect or limited. And to be honest, when I first listened to the song and for years, that was my interpretation, which I'll share with you, and see if what I'll be showing you as the mistaken interpretation will actually be your interpretation as well. And then we'll go into a much more deep, deeper, and I would say almost profound interpretation, which actually will very much echo Neil Young's Heart of Gold, which we've done a few days ago when we looked at the lyrics of that and looked at, hey, there's a common misinterpretation and there's a correct misinterpretation that almost nobody gets. So let's look at the lyrics. The lyrics in the song are verbose. They're complex. There's four long verses. Usually songs have, if they have four verses, the verses tend to be shorter. But, you know, Bob Dylan in this song, he's a poet. He has a lot to say. We'll go over the lyrics, we'll skip some lyrics, and we'll go over them in not such detail because we don't want the video to become excruciatingly long. So we'll go little by little, and let's just have the song uncover itself. And first, we're going to go over the basic interpretation, and we'll see how it's damaging and how maybe, well, like, what are we missing here? Let's start. So... The song is easy to understand if you were taking it at face value. When we go over the lyrics, it's as though Dylan is talking to someone. Once upon a time, you dressed so fine, threw the bums a dime in your prime, didn't you? Right? You immediately kind of see an image of maybe this pompous person dressed so fine, but then the storytelling unfolds immediately. It's once upon a time. It happened ago, a while ago. Maybe something changed. People call and say, beware, doll, you're bound to fall. So there's some foreshadowing here. Something's going to happen to this person. You thought they were kidding you. Everybody who is going through good times, when you're going up and up and up and you're doing well, you really, it's really actually hard to imagine that this can turn, although it can turn so fast. Everything can turn so fast. But anyhow, let's keep going. You used to laugh about, everybody was hanging out. You used to laugh about everybody that was hanging out. Now you don't talk so loud. Now you don't seem so proud about ha having to be scrounging for your next meal. So now this, there's like a fall from grace from, from this person, right? So they were doing well. They're not anymore. They're you know not in a good place, maybe embarrassed. And you can kind of look at... Uh, this song, as if you have the basic interpretation, there's a little bit of gloating, right? Most people are, or at least think of themselves are as coming from a modest background, not, they don't think of themselves as haves, right? They, they think of themselves as have nots, you know? And there's few people who have it made, right? Maybe were born rich, something like that. But there's few of those, and most people can identify with the poorer person's perspective and so it's very easy to be like that other rich person they they were spoiled they had privilege and now they fell and we don't feel guilty for them we don't feel bad for them like they deserve what they had coming whatever right it's very easy to desensitize yourself like that from other people's pain and just be like hey th this is good right and i think this is part of the common misinterpretation of the song that hey down with the man the rich are bad whatever right all that and i think that's had actually a cultural like you know this song has made it into our culture and i think that idea of like the rich are automatically bad just for being rich whether they made their money in a good way or not or whatever their children are automatically you know spoiled whatever i think in a damaging way that's permeated in, into our culture undeservedly you know i think we shouldn't judge people that way but i think there is that strong element but let's keep going we're just on verse one now the choruses are just about the same how does it feel how does it feel to be without a home completely on your own like a rolling stone now to understand what's a rolling stone in modern times we don't really use that language i never heard anybody call somebody else a rolling stone a rolling stone 
means that, and this is obviously important for the song, because the song is called The Rolling Stone. It's generally a person who goes to play from place to place without sticking around any place too much. It can be referred to maybe job hopping, but more like life hopping, like just a person without direction. Um, and this is also important. We're going to come back to this later. It, it, but it also represents change, right? This It's something or somebody who is always going through change. You might think that the change is that this rich person became poor. That's the change, but not quite. So let's keep going down the song because it we want to understand where the song is going lyrically in the first incorrect interpretation so that we can really understand the profoundness of the correct interpretation, which we'll see later. So verse two, ah, you've gone through the finest school, all right, Miss Lonely. So here we have a clue, it's about, it's to a woman, okay, Miss Lonely. This is the first time he addresses somebody. We don't know who she is. When I researched this song, couldn't find out who she was. It could be an abstract somebody, not necessarily one person, maybe a class of people, certain type of people. But you know, you used to get juiced in it. Nobody's ever taught you how to live out on the street. Now you're gonna get have to get used to it. You say you never compromise with the mystery tramp, but now you realize he's not telling any alibis. It's a fun rhymes and imagery. As, and then it's kind of cool as you stare into the vacuum of his eyes and say, do you want to make a deal? I, it gets a little bit haunted. I think it's fun here. Um, but I'd actually like to point your attention to that something in when I was first time originally misinterpreting the song, when I was falling into the incorrect misinterpretation of the song myself, I found that there was just too much gloating in somebody else's misery. Like, you know, it's that I told you so. We don't like people. This, this is not a likable person who gloats in somebody else's misery, regardless of like, okay, well, if, if it was, even if it was a rich person, like I think in the incorrect interpretation, Dylan doesn't make himself look like a good guy, right? He's like a jerk, you know? Like I wouldn't gloat in somebody's misery. I would be a little more compassionate, I'd say, and I think I, that that would be my preference, and I wouldn't want to associate or, you know, uh, glamorize people who gloat in, you know, so, you know, oh, you showed off before, and I have this uh, anger that I was hiding, and now I'm going to let my anger out now that I can, you know, it's like picking on the weak, not my thing, right, and most, it's not most people's thing, and I think actually that turned me off for a long time from this song. I think the tone of this song really turned me off. Like, I think this is a time to be a little compassionate. But anyway, this is all within the common misinterpretation. So let's go to verse three. So verse three is, ah, you never turned around to see the frowns on the jugglers and the clowns when they all did tricks for you. To be fair, the background of the song is that there were way more lyrics than these four verses. And the, Dylan had to cut a lot of the lyrics out, even to pare the song down to this length, which is about five to six minutes. I think it tops out at six minutes, um, which is long for a song. But they had to get it down to be good for the radio, because the radio was really big at that time. You wanted to get it played on the radio, so you had to cut the song down. But I would say this song, you can cut it down way more because I think verse two and verse three is very repetitive of the same idea. Like, yes, you used to be on top of the world. Now you're not. And you used to be not so great. Now you have to get used to it. I think there's repeating of ideas. Um, now, when I criticize this song, let's say immediately that mostly I'm wrong because this is a cultural phenomenon song. Everybody loves this song. It's loved by people all around the world. So bear with me. And when I criticize, I also like, I love Bob Dylan. Like he's been transformative to my own sort of cultural development. So, uh, so when I criticize, it doesn't mean anything, but it's just food for thought really. 
because who am I to criticize him? But I would say the ideas in verse two are very similar to the ideas in verse three. That's my point here. If I was writing this song, I feel like you can pare it down to three verses because modern songs are around like, you got, you got to keep them under five minutes. Even five minutes are long. So it's a perfect chance to cut a verse. If this was more modern song, probably be even three verses, I'd say. But probably I'm wrong. So, because, you know, it's Dylan. He knows better. Um, but anyway, it just keeps going on and on. Like, it keeps on being gloating, right? Like, you never understood that it ain't no good. You shouldn't let other people do kicks for you. Get your kicks for you. You used to ride on a chrome horse with your diplomat who carried on his shoulder a Siamese cat. Now it gets kind of cool and fun and builds a little bit in storytelling. But it, And there's some interesting things in the rhyme schemes, which is why he kind of needed to have all the lines. But that's for songwriting nerds that we're not going to get into here because I think for most people, rhyme schemes are not that interesting. Like, does the first line rhyme with the second line or the third line? Not interesting, I think, for most people. Even though I write songs, it's not even that interesting for me because the rhyme schemes here are so complicated that I'd never try them. Anyway, uh, I do like the imagery. A diplomat who carried on his shoulder a Siamese cat. Ain't it hard when you discover that he really wasn't where it's at? And, and Dylan actually really sings this well. There's a lot of emotion in this. He really wasn't where it's at. You know, he does that when he sings it. That line is very memorable in, in his tone. After he took from you everything he could steal. Really kind of turns here. Now, we don't know who is this diplomat. We don't know who is this person, right, that he's singing to. So it's all sort of vague a little bit. Now, ah, princess on a steeple, verse 4. And all the pretty people, they're all drinking, thinking they got it made, exchanging all the precious. It's like a lot of blah, 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 basically gloating, which is why I'm trying to rush through it because I feel like it's boring. And I feel for a modern listener, to be completely honest, when I listen to the song musically, it doesn't keep me engaged like his other songs, like Knocking on Heaven's Door or many other ones. This one... I get lost somewhere in the middle, like four minutes in, I get a little bored. Again, this song has been heard by, you know, billions of people around the world. Who am I to criticize this? But at the same time, you know, perhaps my opinion is not just limited to me, perhaps others share it. But I do get lost in it. It's a little repetitive. It's a little bit too much blah, blah, blahs. Like, nobody will tell Dylan to be like, you are wrong. But when I write songs, and my songs sometimes also get verbose, everybody tells me, hey, cut it down. And then at first I'm like, no, but I love these lyrics. And then they're like, no, no, you got to cut it down. And then I go through my you know, five stages of grief. At first you're like, no, and then you make peace with it, and then you do the change. So that's what I do in my music. And generally people can tell me when I'm wrong, and people always tell me, cut it down. And here I would tell Dylan, cut, it, cut the lyrics down because... I have the same problem and I always just cut my lyrics down and it's actually sometimes less is more because I get a little bit as a listener this is not my go to Dylan song this is not my favorite song of his I get a little bit bored the melody is a little bit you know it gets a little bit repetitive everything gets a little too repetitive a little too much gloating I don't think there are big lightning bolt moments that come so too frequently enough to keep me engaged as a modern listener. Now, this song is decades and decades old. So I, if memory serves me right, it's from 1965. So, you know, a, for that audience, this was tremendous. For the modern listener, you got to go a little faster. And I think paring down some lyrics actually would have helped even more than he already had done. And then it goes on and on, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's just be done with this because uh, there's some people point out that in the end of the song, there's a little silver lining that says, you know, uh, let's just read the four lines together. At Napoleon in, used to be so amused at Napoleon in rags and the language that he used. Go to him, he calls you, you can't refuse. When you ain't got nothing, you ain't got nothing to lose. You're invisible now. You've got no secrets to conceal. So these last two lines really kind of give a silver lining of hope. I feel like this is uh, philosophically unsatisfying. Like, 
It's like, oh, your life is so terrible now, but you got nothing to lose, so it's fine now. That doesn't help. Um, this is a little just nothing here. I wouldn't really interpret this as a silver lining um, unless you really, really love for all of your fairy tales to only have happy endings and that's what you need. If you need that personally, you can have that, but I don't think this is what's happening here too much. I think this is actually more gloating. Um, but this is all, all of this has been the first incorrect interpretation. The profound interpretation, before we get to the profound, the reason it's incorrect is that it's so easy for just about anyone, especially young people, because young people are even poorer than themselves when they get older, right? And when did we hear the song? Pretty young, when we were pretty young. I heard the song when I was a teenager. Even if you're growing up decades after the song is released, you probably hear it when you're relatively young as a teen. And of course, teens have no money. People in their 20s, when they're young, they have not much money. So it's very easy to be like, yeah, the rich, you know, I have to work hard and the rich are bad. And of course, it's easy to identify with this person who's like the have not, who is gloating at the, the have, right? The, this wealthy person. So most people have this identification with the song and they're like, yeah, the rich are bad and whatever. Spoiled people are bad. Privileged people are bad. Uh, you know, I, I think it may be a little premature to just say that they're bad like that. This is all within that incorrect misinterpretation. The profound interpretation is that what Dylan was really trying to do is show that all the people in who are going to be listening to the song, who have these ideas that, hey, the rich are bad and, you know, all, all the faults lie within them and it's so easy to point out. Well, you know, those very young people who are poor are actually part of this generation. In that case, it was the 60s, but I think this is as true as it was then it is now. They are the haves. Those people that think that they are the have-nots, they are the haves. And the rolling stone is not that rich person. The rolling stone, the thing that, the, the thing that keeps changing is the almost like the carpet, the culture, the country, the world underneath them keeps changing. And they're not realizing that it's like a reversal of the, the, ta the tables are reversed. The people who are going like, oh yeah, the rich are bad. They are the rich ones. So the profound moment here is that it's really easy to point the finger and say, those rich are bad. Where generally you have a lot of privileges yourself. You have a lot of culture, wh whatever your upbringing is, you have so many advantages maybe not the same advantages as others, but certainly everybody has a lot of strengths and advantages that they've had in their life that they don't realize that they are the very people who are the rich against whom they are railing in this song. So they're identifying with the poor and they're like, the rich are bad, but they are the rich. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's basically a cultural change and every generation has their own cultural change where the people creating the change are pointing to others at fault whereas the people making the change are just as guilty of their own set of problems and perhaps in some generations even worse but it's profoundly difficult to be like as a listener to have this individual experience and say the song is about me being wrong. I got a chance to go to high school, to college. I got this chance. I got this chance. I got this chance. I got all this, you know, especially now where even some of the poorest people today are so much better than some of the poorest people 100 years ago or even the middle class. So there's a lot of ways to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm as guilty. And... It's even harder to look deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper at just how privileged the people who think they are not privileged are. This is the profound part of this song that people don't understand because it's actually psychologically difficult to do. It's so easy to point the finger. So easy. We do this all the time. So hard 
to be like, hmm, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's really about me looking inside yourself and realizing, um, having this honest conversation with yourself. This is very similar. I mentioned Neil Young earlier in this video. This is very similar to Neil Young because heart of gold. I've been searching for a heart of gold. It's not I've been searching for a heart of gold in somebody else. It's I've been mining for a heart of gold in myself so I can be that person for somebody else, right? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, I wish I found a heart of gold in somebody else. No, no, no. you got to make your own heart of gold inside you first. It's that kind of profound idea, perhaps a little hippy dippy, okay? Because you can also go take this the wrong way. You can also self hate, right? Like, oh, I'm so, yes, I am so privileged then. I am so, I have so much and other people have nothing. So I should just feel terrible about being myself and I hate myself. So this is, this is the other extreme. If you're, if you really, interpret it the right way but take it too far then you start to like self-hate and feel guilty for being who you are but generally the irony of the song is for people who are quick to point the finger at the other people who did wrong and not realize they're also doing a bunch of things perhaps wrong that's the interesting and profound interpretation of the song and i hope you enjoyed it and i hope this was something here was new because certainly I know when I first listened to the song the first thousands of times I had the inclination to interpret it that wrong way and only when I spend more time with the song and learn more about it then I'm like oh oh it's you know kind of about me maybe anyway hope you enjoyed it my name is Alec Kinodinik and on this channel, if you like Bob Dylan, you know, he's a great poet. I also write music and write songs that I try. I try my best to, to create really beautiful poetry too. Now, I'm not Bob Dylan. I'm not promising that. But certainly if you like music with interesting lyrics and interesting poetry, then please try some of my music as well because I'm not Dylan, but I try to do something similar. So I'll link up my songs and my music in the research resources of this video and also they'll be in the comments so if you want to find them i appreciate every listener because you know if you make music and somebody listens to you and they even like it i, I feel like as the creator of the song you you really should appreciate people who listen and i'll really appreciate if you listen so please take a look at that my songs are there my my poetry book is linked up in the uh, resources of this video. So thank you for listening. Hope this was enjoyable and I'll see you in my next video.